Вітання усім глядачам Форум ТВ. Раді вас вітати. Сьогодні в дуже затишному, прекрасному місці ресторан Old Mill. Дякуємо за те, що люб'ясно надали нам сьогодні це прекрасне місце для нашої розмови. Друзі, я сьогодні хочу представити вам члена парламенту Канади. Ми сьогодні будемо говорити з містером Гарнет Дженіосом. Будемо говорити про його так само причетність до української громади, до української діаспори і також про його діяльність як члена парламенту Канади. Отож, запрошуємо вас до цього інтерв'ю і гарного перегляду. Great to be with you today. Great to be with you, Roxelana. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. So, how are you doing? Very well. It's great to be here. It's great to be in in Etobicoke. And I know there's a very strong Ukrainian community here in Toronto. We also have a very strong and active Ukrainian community in in my own riding. So, though far from home, I feel very much at home being here as well. So, as we are talking for our Ukrainian community today, are you familiar with the Ukrainian diaspora? So, particularly you answered my question, but are you familiar with the Ukrainian diaspora living all over Canada from coast to coast? Maybe you had ever had any collaborations or whatever? Yes, well, thank you for that. So, in particular, I'm most familiar with the Ukrainian experience in my own constituency, which is very strong and growing. I know, of course, there's been different waves of Ukrainian immigration to Canada in different parts of the country. I'll just share a little bit with your viewers about my own riding, Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. We had a significant early Ukrainian migration to to this part of Alberta. Uh, we have a uh, Ukrainian community going back uh, generations. Uh, and as, as part of that, we also have something called the Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Village, which is uh, kind of an outdoor museum uh, of the Ukrainian pioneer experience. So kind of showing uh, the, the early Ukrainian pioneers coming to Alberta, settling, uh, establishing themselves and, uh, and, and, and how they lived. Uh, when I was younger, I was part of a summer camp that was there. Wow. Um, and uh, and also we have some eminent Ukrainian Canadians from my riding, uh, the former premier of Alberta, Ed Stelmak, uh, Ukrainian background, uh, you know, very strong in the community, uh, is, a, is a constituent of mine, a represented part of my riding at the provincial level. Uh, since getting elected, uh, I've appreciated the opportunity to work with the Ukrainian community in particular on human rights issues. I've got a great deal of, uh, of, uh, of passion for justice and human rights, uh, and uh, just seeing uh, some of the uh, the, the terrible human rights abuses happening in Russian occupied parts of uh, parts of Ukraine uh, and uh, talking to Ukrainian Canadians as well as uh, as people of uh, Tatar uh, background about uh, things happening in Crimea and, and other parts of the occupied areas and I think it's so important that Canada stand up for justice and human rights that we have a principled foreign policy in every case uh, that we stand up to the Putin uh, regime and that we stand for victims of that regime in occupied Ukraine as well as in Russia itself. We're, we're seeing uh, the voices of, of uh, some Russians coming forward advocating for democracy and human rights in, in their own country as well. So I've appreciated the opportunity to collaborate with the Ukrainian community on, on those important issues. Uh, and I visited Ukraine at the time of the 25th anniversary. I was in, in Kiev and uh, it, was, it was such a powerful moment for me because this was, was you know, a few years after the, um, the Euromaidan and, um, and our our tour guide was, was a young man who was uh, setting up some of the meetings and who was just showing us, you know, this is where we were running while we were getting shot at and uh, um, uh, it's just so powerful to see the, the love of country that motivates such, such sacrifice. It was around the same time we were celebrating our 150th anniversary here in Canada. And of course, that's, that's an important milestone, but, uh, but nobody remembers 150 years ago, and, and uh, we're, we're kind of comfortable and used to our freedom, right? Whereas there was a, uh, kind of a, a, a rawness, a raw gratitude in those 25-year celebrations because so many people remember a time uh, when they didn't have their own country. And of course, it's in the midst of, of ongoing violence and, and occupation in parts of the country. So uh, it was a really uh, powerful experience for me to be there at that time. It's great to hear this from you. So a new Canada's conservative human rights policy was announced by the Premier recently. Uh, Canada is doing more to stand up for human rights, not only within the country, but also in the whole world. So um, in one of your recent YouTube updates, you mentioned the great role of diaspora in this case. Mm -hmm. Could you please specify? Yes. Uh, Thank you. So uh, very pleased that our leader Aaron O'Toole announced the, the new conservative human rights policy which will 
reestablish Canadian leadership on international human rights issues. And there's a number of different parts to that policy. Part of that is specifically strengthening engagement with diaspora communities. We want to create a national advisory body representative of different cultural and faith communities in Canada to inform government policy when it comes to international human rights. We know that often those community ties can bring information, awareness and understanding directly into government ahead of other channels being able to pick up that information. Uh, it's been very important, uh, was in government for us to work with the Ukrainian community and we see other instances of this. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the Iranian community during uh, protest movements there uh, being able to, to inform our awareness of, of, uh, of, of what happened. A couple years ago uh, there was a, a protest in Sudan that had some similar features with the, with the protests in Ukraine where people were, were uh, seeking political change uh, and, and uh, democracy. Um, and the work that happens with diaspora communities in these contexts is, is very important and very, very valuable. Um, there's many other aspects to the human rights policy that we've, we've announced. So one of them is around uh, the Magnitsky Act. Uh, and uh, the Magnitsky Act was put forward by James Bazan, who's been a great champion in our caucus uh, for, for issues involving Ukraine. Uh, the bill passed, uh, but it hasn't been used enough. The Magnitsky Act provides a tool for the minister to sanction those involved in gross violations of human rights. Uh, but it, uh, it's only as good as its use by the government who's willing to sanction officials. And uh, what we are proposing to do now is expand and strengthen the Magnitsky Act by creating a mechanism by which members of parliament as well as members of the public can petition to have names added to that list, essentially nominating people saying, we know this individual is involved in gross violations of human rights and they should be added to the list. And uh, it's still up to the government. but. The government has to, will have to respond in writing if uh, a request reaches a certain threshold of support. So uh, if the Ukrainian community comes forward and saying we know these individuals are involved in, in violations of human rights, uh, then it becomes incumbent on the government to answer that petition in some way and say yes we will or no we won't sanction and, and, and here's why. Um, so, so those are some of the elements of the human rights uh, policy. One other one I'll just quickly mention uh, is uh, creating a public list of prisoners of conscience of particular concern. So uh, this is uh, something we're seeing uh, with the Navalny case right now in Russia, and there's others of, of people that have been vocal advocates of human rights, uh, maybe uh, uh, politicians, former politicians, religious figures who are uh, who are locked up to prevent them from from having their message heard. And having a public list of prisoners of conscience of particular concern that the government of Canada would maintain and publish, as well as mechanisms for citizens to petition to have names added to that list, uh, brings more attention to these cases, uh, ensures these, that these cases won't be uh, in the dark, and in a sense, it magnifies the message of these people who are being uh, incarcerated uh, so that their voices will be heard in spite of their incarceration. Absolutely, and thank you very much for uh, taking into consideration that many people who are uh, right now in Ukraine, in Russia, they had to be expanded to the Magnitsky Act because Magnitsky Act is a great piece of legislation and uh, taking into consideration the situation in the eastern part of Ukraine uh, where the Ukrainian soldiers are fighting with the Russian troop and also taking into consideration the Crimea annexation and the situation there. Um, how do you think, is it important to expand the Magnitsky list, especially with the people that are involved in the situation in, in Ukraine right now? Yes, absolutely. We, we know that the Magnitsky Act is a very effective tool because oftentimes people that are involved in autocratic regimes, they uh, they still want to be able to travel to other countries Absolutely. and in particular they also want to have that escape hatch. They understand if they're part of a repressive regime that sometimes uh, that regime can turn against them and so they want to be able to, uh, to you know, to, to take, to steal, to, to, to strengthen their own position and also have that, uh, that parachute available to them. Uh, Magnitsky sanctions, they, they limit people's ability to travel and invest, but the most important impact of them is that they say to officials that are associated with, uh, with authoritarian regimes, if you cross a certain threshold in terms of human rights abuses, you will not be able to have that parachute. You will have to stay home and face the music. And this, this can be a powerful deterrent uh, for people uh, who might otherwise engage in human rights abuses. So it's a, it's a great piece of political technology. It's a great tool uh, that allows us to deter human rights violations happening in other countries. And we know that uh, 
preventing the expansion of Magnitsky sanctions legislation around the world is actually a key priority of the Russian government. Uh, there could be no, no clearer endorsement of the Magnitsky Act than uh, the evidence we have that it's such a priority of the Putin regime to stop Magnitsky Acts from being passed in various uh, countries around the world. And you know, this is something that was initially proposed and championed in the context of, of, uh, of Russia and, and Ukraine. But I, I hear from now so many other cultural communities in Canada uh, that see this as an important tool as well. And uh, we've talked about Magnitsky sanctions in the context of, of China and, and other, other places. To your question about expansion, absolutely. Uh, we need to expand the use of the Magnitsky Act. Uh, and, and, uh, and again, it's only as good as its use. Uh, so, so we, we are trying to think through how do we expand its use? How do we, how do we push the government to have more names added to it? Uh, and this is where we identified the value of a citizen initiated and a parliamentary trigger uh, so that uh, when names should be added to that list, uh, people can directly petition the minister and the minister has to respond. Uh, that doesn't mean that people are always going to be happy about the decision ministers make, uh, but it means that if someone is, a, is clearly violating human rights and that name is put in front of the minister and the minister has to respond, it just becomes a lot harder politically for the minister to say no to that. Uh, right now, without that kind of parliamentary trigger or, or citizen-initiated trigger, it, it's easier for ministers to just ignore uh, proposals around this. But we're creating a mechanism that, that guarantees at least greater engagement uh, with the process because the minister has to respond to those requests. The leader of your party, Arin O'Toole, announced recently that conservatives will seek a, a to create a task force for credential recognition. This means that new people moving to Canada and willing to work here will have a chance to have a pre-qualification. Mm -hmm. As how the Ukrainian community is growing so fast and many Ukrainians are willing to come to Canada, um, how this task force might help them? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Very, very important question. This is something we hear regularly uh, from people in the Ukrainian community as well as other communities, recent immigrants who uh, have qualifications that they're not able to use mm -hmm. in Canada. And oftentimes they, they come with an expectation that they'll be able to use those qualifications. And then they're, uh, they're surprised and they struggle when they get here because they, they have field, a field and expertise that they're not able to work in. Uh, Everybody knows that this is a problem, and it's a problem that's been talked about for a long time. Uh, liberals have been in power for six years. I think they've really dithered on it, uh, and there's been a lot of uh, finger pointing in in these and other issues where the federal government points at provinces, provinces point at professional associations. The, the, the you know the the, the, the the pointing fingers happens, and I think it's it's time for the federal government to to take leadership on this. Recognize that yes, it is complex because the certification does happen within professional associations generally, and it's under provincial jurisdiction. But the federal government is responsible for immigration and there should be uh, a collective action plan, there should be better coordination. So we've, we've committed out of the gate to creating a national task force to confront this issue, bringing stakeholders together, working on an action plan. Uh, and we've said that part of that action plan, part of that, uh, the work of that task force should include looking at pre-qualification, looking at the ways in which people who are planning on coming to Canada can seek Canadian standard qualifications, uh, can get their, their qualifications recognized uh, in advance. Um, and so this could, this could happen in a number of different ways. It might be through the accreditation of institutions in other countries to issue Canadian standard qualifications. It might be through distance learning. It might be through uh, Canadian officials going over and giving people an opportunity to challenge exams while they're in other countries before they come to Canada. And if we're able to uh, start to develop these, these systems of pre-qualification, it gives people the certainty that when they arrive in Canada, they will have that piece of paper in their hand. They will know that they can get off the plane and get to work right away in, in their field. And one other point I want to make just about this uh, in the context of, uh, of, of Ukraine, uh, that uh, I, I think the, looking at pre-qualification doesn't just help Canada and help newcomers. It also helps the countries that people are coming from. Because if, if we're able to establish partnerships between post-secondary institutions uh, that strengthen uh, the, the certification process, strengthen the credentials that people are receiving, uh, if we're able to, through those partnerships, provide additional know-how and training, uh, that that is a, a great way of strengthening post-secondary institutions, strengthening qualifications, uh, and, uh, and, and strengthening the sort of seamlessness of, uh, uh, of transition. So it's both. It's, it's great news for newcomers, but it's also a way of building up uh, post-secondary and other education capacity in other countries. 
since your election in 2015, you have gained a reputation of the most outspoken parliamentarians, yeah, because you have spoken more than 100,000 words in the chamber during only your first year. Uh, so, wow, this is great. And I guess one of the most important roles for you as a parliamentarian and a politician is to be heard and also to be the voice of the others. Am I right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, um, my, uh, my passion for human rights comes from, from my family. My, uh, my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor uh, and many members of her, her family were killed and, uh, and I think about the fact that uh, you know, she was able to survive because even though she didn't have a voice that could be heard as a child, as someone who was a, who was a victim, uh, there were others who spoke out in defense of people who, who were like her and uh, I want to use the voice I have now to speak out uh, for, for justice, for human rights, for human dignity for those whose voices are less likely to be heard in, in the halls of power and, and especially victims of human rights abuses around the world. Mr. Junius, uh, previously you served as Shadow Minister for Multiculturalism and I want to ask you uh, what a conservative uh, vision of freedom and pluralism looks like uh, in Canada now because the country mm -hmm. is facing many challenges including the world's pandemic and many many others so what it means for Canada to be multicultural today mm -hmm. now that's a that's a great question and uh, it, it comes at I think a time when there are uh, we're seeing certain challenges to the fabric of that multiculturalism. So uh, there have been uh, a number of churches, including uh, Ukrainian churches, that have been vandalized uh, or burned down. Uh, there's an increase in, in other forms of, of violence that are have targeting uh, certain communities, the Jewish community, the Muslim community, uh, and um, and I think we have to. We have to think then about how we counter these uh, these negative currents of violence towards certain communities, and how we uh, build unity and understanding and a, a well-functioning multiculturalism. And um, you know, I, I think uh, there are there are a lot of different elements to that. Uh, I think it it starts at the individual and local level, people being committed to learning about and understanding other cultures, uh, and to entering into genuine dialogue. Uh, I think it it needs to include a clear commitment. Uh, from leaders all the way down that we, we, we might have differences but we resolve our differences uh, through dialogue, through discussion and not through acts of violence. Uh, rejecting uh, any doctrines of collective guilt, you know, saying we don't we don't hold whole groups of people responsible for what individuals within those groups do. Uh, we look at individuals as individuals, you know, part, parts of communities, uh, of course, but not responsible for what um, what others within that those communities may have done. Uh, I, so I, I think uh, a clear commitment to, to peace, to dialogue, to pluralism, to resolving differences of opinion uh, through dialogue is is needed now more than ever. And that, that might have seemed obvious at one time. Uh, but I don't think we can take uh, our, our peaceful pluralism for granted. I think some of the events of recent months show how important it is uh, for uh, leaders to be, uh, be condemning acts of violence and promoting understanding and dialogue. Um, you know, I, I, I think in general, as, as we look to the possibility of an election and, and kind of what's, what's coming up this fall, uh, my encouragement to people is always, you know, don't, don't take Canada for granted. Don't assume uh, that uh, the freedoms we've had, the prosperity that we've had, uh, is going to continue unless we, we uh, sustain it with the hard work that is, that is required to have sound public finances, to have, uh, have protection of our freedoms, and to have a good understanding of pluralism and, 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 and that uh, sort of substructure of, of, uh, of justice. Um, you know, I, I think about uh, you know, being in Ukraine, 25th anniversary, and just the uh, the rawness of feeling from people who who had an appreciation that uh, that uh, that freedom, that uh, that sovereignty is not inevitable. It it came about through the the hard work and commitments of patriots who sacrificed to achieve that. Uh, and I think we need that same sense in Canada, that. Um, that, that, that the great country we have and the great country that we've built uh, is, is not an accident. It's not automatic. It's here because of the work and sacrifice that we commit to every day. A kind of a bit personal question mm -hmm. for you because you're a father of four kids. Yeah. I have two and I really appreciate people 
who uh, have more kids and are doing well in their career. So what is that life work balance for you personally? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I've got I've got four young kids, as you mentioned, between about two and uh, and one that's uh, that's now eight. And uh, in terms of work what like balance, wh one thing I'll say is that uh, my kids are at an age still the older ones, especially where they love to be involved in the things that I'm doing. And there are many aspects to politics that you can do together as a family. So uh, my older two, especially my, uh, my older daughter, uh, love to come door knocking with me from time to time. Uh, and they love to come out to community events. And, and obviously, there are some things that are, uh, that are sort of fun family events, right? If there's a, a cultural community that's having, a, having an event, uh, you know, usually it's, it's uh, pretty automatic uh, to bring, uh, bring my wife, bring the kids. The whole family. Um, yeah, for, for uh, you know, obviously for certain kinds of meetings, it's less possible. Now, COVID has, has shifted some of that a little bit too because uh, a lot more is happening remotely. So uh, I've been able to be at home much more in the last year than I would normally be, uh, you know, and uh, I, uh, I'm on my computer working in a meeting and then my, my wife sends the, the two-year-old in to get a diaper change and, you know, so, so I can, I can uh, pitch in in those little moments with those things that are, uh, you know, just, just still contributing. So it's, it's um, you know, the, we'll see how this virtual technology develops. Um, you know, there are some limitations with it for Parliament, but I, uh, I am hopeful that it will, um, that, that some of these, these technologies will continue to be used and they'll create more opportunities for parents of young children to be kind of engaged in different ways than they might have otherwise been able to do because they're able to work or attend meetings from home. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's a sacrifice, obviously, from a family perspective to be involved in politics, but, um, but it's also in large part because of my kids that I am doing this work, because of the country that I want to pass along to them. Uh, during the possible upcoming election, conservatives are talking about securing the future. Uh, and for me, that means securing a future for my kids, that they will be able to grow up in a country uh, that, is, that is as good or better than the country that I grew up in. That, that, and that's part of not taking our country for granted. Thank you very much for joining Forum TV today. It was a pleasure to have our, our conversation today and good luck. I wish you good luck to you and your family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Друзі, дуже дякуємо вам за увагу до нашого сьогоднішнього інтерв'ю. Нагадаю, ми сьогодні говорили з паном Гарнетом Дженіосом, він є депутатом парламенту Канади в Саскачуванні в Альберті. Дякую, що були з нами. Не забудьте переглядати всі версії Форум ТВ на нашому YouTube-каналі. Там є абсолютно всі програми наші в повних версіях. Дякую, що дивилися. До побачення.